Let me turn next to splits um, in Europe and around Europe, the ally of the United States from which the United States is splitting in more ways than one. First of all, here are the splits inside Europe that are becoming aggravated. Many, many people in Europe are upset and have been for years that the European Union was a union invented, orchestrated, constructed, and run for employers, not employees. That that's what the European Union accomplished, profitable opportunities for employers and ever more difficult problems for employees, harder to hold on to good jobs and good wages, harder to hold on to a social services program from your own government under the pressure of competition within the unified Europe. More and more Europeans felt, and they've expressed it from the beginning, that something valuable had been lost beyond what they had been told, beyond what they had expected. Something very nationalistic had been lost, and they didn't want to lose it. That the European Union threatened what was distinctive about French or Dutch or Spanish or Greek national values, national political customs, national cultures. And those splits have not gone away. They have gotten worse. And one of the key reasons, and you'll see this as a theme, is that the economic well-being of the mass of the working class in Europe has taken terrible blows in the first 20 years of this century, really the first 20 years of the experiment of a unified Europe with a single currency, the euro, and so on. It means that they are now seeing the war in Ukraine as more evidence that something is going on that makes them irritable, suspicious, skeptical, that this war isn't really about what the leaders say it is about. And they see huge amounts of money being shifted over to help a small country that most of them have very little to do with and very little feeling for. What you do have is inside each European country, in or out of the EU, a struggle going on, particularly for the last 30 years, a struggle between those who want to advance the capitalist profitability of their economies by being more like the United States and the United Kingdom, by reforming their labor markets, by reducing their social services, by shifting the burden of taxes off of corporations onto individuals, to do in Europe what they see seems to have worked well in the United States. Those people are squeezing the working classes in every one of those countries, and the working class feels it, and the working class resents it. One of the interesting things that have had to be done in the face of an angry, upset, threatened working class is to distract them from the capitalist system that is their problem and has been from the beginning. They need to be distracted if the capitalist system can continue to do what it's been working so hard to do these last 30 years, become more profitable, become more like the United States and Britain. Even as the United States and Britain go further and further in that direction so that the rest of Europe is always, in some sense, catching up. What are the distractions? Well, we know them. They're not so different from the similar distractions used here. Part of Europe has been excited beyond words for decades against immigrants. You see the shrinking wage, the shrinking social care for people that is part of the capitalist program in Europe, as it has been, 
is blamed on immigrants. They are the problem. They cause money to be used in ways that aren't good for the native population. All those kinds of stories. And they are very big in everywhere from Scandinavia in the north to, to Greece and Spain and Italy in the south and everywhere in between. The very problems of capitalism globally producing chaos and masses of refugees coming, you guessed it, to prosperous Europe, then produces this kind of backlash, which is a distraction, a way to blame something other than the economic system for the problems of the economic system. Here's another distraction. The war. War in the Middle East, war in Ukraine, war anywhere. Now we can rev up the patriotism. We can rev up the hostility to others. The splits between Christians and Muslims can be brought forward, as can other splits, some old, some new. They're useful as ways of distracting and deflecting the suffering of working classes from the system that puts them in that position. And the Europeans are acutely aware of all of this, just like they're aware that the United States and Britain are extreme cases of this, and that therefore following them is a very dubious matter. For example, the British came up with a way of deflecting the anger of their working class, which was more extreme. But that's not a surprise because the British working class, particularly after 2008, was really heavily damaged by the austerity programs of the conservatives in the British government and by the inability of the labor movement, except for the short period of Mr. Corbyn, to be much of an opposition about any of that. And so they had to come up with an extreme distraction. They did. It's called Brexit. They convinced the British people, you know, your problem is the Europeans. We should split from Europe. They did. The British economy has been going down ever since. The condition of the working class going down ever since. It solved nothing. It gave Mr. Boris Johnson a naughty boy with bad hair, an opportunity to become famous because he galvanized a bitter working class's desire for something to change, and maybe he could do it. Maybe somehow by distancing Europe, by leaving Europe, by splitting from Europe, it could be, there was nothing there. In the famous line, there's no there there. There was no policy. And of course, Mr. Johnson leaves as befuddled and irrelevant to what's going on. Indeed, his parting shot will in the future be understood not to be lying to the British people about the contempt that he holds for them, but rather his excited embrace of the war in Ukraine almost in a cartoonish way, to get everyone excited in Britain about his solidarity with Mr. Zelensky, etc., as a way of distracting people from the reality of the British economy, which is, and I am not exaggerating, an unmitigated disaster. The Europeans are also smart folks, and they understand they're at a turning point in the world. They know the splits I've spoken of. They're acutely aware of them. And they are aware that the working class they have been squeezing because they felt they had to, to compete with the United States, to follow the United States, but also to try desperately to construct a European capitalism that could play the role in the world that the United States had played maybe not be the successor empire to the United States' empire, but at least be a contestant. They haven't been able to do it. 
They're so needy to distract their people. They're so needy to accommodate the nationalism so that their working class doesn't turn against them, that that same nationalism that saves them condemns them to be unable to become a unified capitalist competitor in the world. And they know it and they suffer from it. 